What is up, everybody? This is Paul Critchley, president of New England Lean Consulting. Welcome to another episode of the New England Lean Podcast. This episode has been a long time coming, both in uh, how long it's taken me to actually get the guest and how long it's taken me to post it since we recorded it. Uh, apologies, Kyle Kumpf, for that. We recorded this uh, several weeks ago, and shame on me, I kind of did it, and I didn't have it timed out very well. So we got uh, held up because we did a lot of interviews, obviously, at the GBMP conference, and it took a couple, three weeks to get through all of those. So apologies again, Kyle. I know this has been in the in queue for a while, but here it is. So again, we welcome Kyle Kumpf to the show this week. And, you know, if you don't know Kyle and you don't follow him on LinkedIn, I highly recommend you do so. Follow him, connect with him. Super smart guy. Uh, he and I have been connected for a long, long time. And he recently launched a series on Deming's 14 points. And it's such a good idea. It, like, makes me mad it's such a good idea because I wish I had thought of it. But kudos to Kyle for for putting this out there. So we talk a lot about that. Um, and kind of where he comes from with all of this. Now, real quick background with Kyle. He's uh, a certified Six Sigma Green Belt through Villanova. He has a certificate through there. Um, he's a professional scrum master, agile leader. Uh, he actually has a, a Bachelor's of Science in Packaging Engineering from Indiana State, which we didn't get a chance to talk about that, so maybe the next time. Uh, he also has an organizational leadership degree, um, for banking and the from the University of Wisconsin. So similar, I you know, I have a organizational leadership from Quinnipiac, so that kind of lilted its way into our conversation as well. But it's a great conversation and really the reason I was so excited to get Kyle on there and I'll 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 use his words right on the top of his LinkedIn profile. Under his name it says this, ending human suffering as it relates to process in financial services, because that's the industry that Kyle works in. But I love the fact that that's how he comes at lean, ending human, human suffering. Because isn't that a great synopsis of really what all this stuff is about? So it was awesome conversation. Kyle, thank you again for coming on the show. And for my listeners, as always, I hope you like it. I hope you get something from it. Have a great week, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. All right, welcome to the New England Lean Podcast. As I mentioned in the intro this week, Kyle Kumpf. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Paul. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this should be a good time. I've been looking forward to chatting with you. I know um, we've been interacting a lot lately because you have this whole LinkedIn series going, which I think is genius, by the way, of four, uh, Deming's 14 points. Yes, yeah, it's something I started uh Seven weeks ago, yes, I believe, because I'm, I'm posting point eight today. So that'll come out later this afternoon. Nice. I'll be on the lookout for sure. So I really like to start, Kyle. You know, not everybody knows everybody, especially listeners of the show. So uh, in the case that people don't follow you or aren't connected with you, can you kind of walk us through how you got into lean, what drew you into it, why you get excited about it? Yeah, there's all kinds of good stories I could tell. Um, but uh, what I like to say, just even going back further than that, I, I learned a little bit about it in college. Um, it was in some of the operations classes. I went to school for engineering, um, but I really didn't get exposed to it until I was actually in the real workforce. And in, in the course of my first job, there was a, a an engineering manager who kind of took me under his wing. And um, he could kind of tell that he and I really thought alike. So he started talking about all this stuff that he had done in previous work and things that he was trying to do at this uh, company we worked with. And he gave me the book Lean Thinking. And so I, I took that and like I started reading it and I couldn't put it down. Mm. Um, and that, that kind of started everything from there. Cause then I came back, I'd read it, go talk to him. I'm like, oh yeah, let's do this, this, and this. And I guess help us solve this problem, that problem. Um, so that's really kind of where it started. Um, but I do recall uh, one moment where I really had that first kind of aha moment about, you know, why do we do something this way or why are we doing this kind of measure instead of this kind of measure? And um, so I worked in a warehouse where we were just fulfilling orders each day. We had pickers going in, picking boxes, putting them on carts, and then whatever's on those carts would get put into um, shipping cartons, sealed up, and then go down a conveyor and onto a shipping truck for PPS, FedEx, or whatever the carrier was. <clears throat> and 
the uh, one of the higher ups um, wanted to put this extra quality check right after a carton was packed. And I kind of thought to myself, well, we have a hundred percent inspection right before something gets packed. So what I'm kind of thinking, what 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 value is this extra checkpoint going to add? So I did it. I set it up, and we would I'd periodically walk over there, grab a carton off the line, and open it up, look at the packing slip, verify, yep, that's what's supposed to be in there, or no, what's not, and I keep a little log of it. And as you can imagine, I I, bear, I didn't find anything. Um, but then one time I did. I found one one error. So a, a carton had been packed incorrectly. And so he's like, okay, great. Well, let's, let's start checking more and more. And I'm like, mm. something doesn't quite, quite seem right about this. So <clears throat> I still continue my periodic checks. And, but then I started to go back through and follow the path of these items throughout the warehouse. And I went back and I started, I watched the, the, the packers of the line who are pulling bo- uh, items off the carts and thing in the boxes. And I'm looking there and they you know they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're following standard. Um, but I continue to watch. Well, then I caught one time a, a cart was pulled up and the packer picked up this box that was on top of it, which the top of the cart was not a, a standard location to put items. Um, and so then she um, picked that up and, and, and packed that box up. And so I asked her, why did you, why is that item sitting on top? And she goes, well, that's what a picker will do if the item doesn't fit in one of the cubes in the cart. So all the items are measured when they come in and they're, uh, that dimensions are, are, those dimensions are put into a, a, um, a database and then that helps select cartons that that thing will fit into. And she goes, sometimes they don't fit, so they put them, in, and if something fits in the cart cube, then you know it'll fit in the box. Mm. She goes, sometimes they don't fit, so they'll stack them on top. I go, hmm, that's interesting. So then I went back to where items are received. And uh, long story short, it came down to that item that uh, she was picking up the top of the cart had been measured incorrectly, um, or at least there had been an, an error in the data entry. So I went back and looked at the logs and found, oh, um, when they wrote down the, the dimensions, uh, a five looked like a three. Mm. Um, something like that had happened. And then that, the wrong number got punched into the system, threw everything off. Um, and so really the error that I had found in that that last quality check could be prevented. We wouldn't even really need that quality check if we just go back and to the source where those items are coming in and getting measured and, and put something in place to make sure we, we measure them correctly or we we put something in place so that the, you know, the, the fives don't look like a, a three mm-hmm. or something else. Um, and so that's what we did. And that was kind of my first little aha moment of like, here's why it's critical to think this way and, and to you know, act like you are the product and follow the path, uh, follow the value stream and, and see where the, the opportunities for error are. That's, I love, that's a great story. And I don't know, have you shared that before? I don't recognize that one. I have, I have not. I, I actually was, I had the thought of writing up a little more detailed article about it. Just haven't got around to it yet. Yeah. But that's well, the essence of it. Yeah. And th- cause that's a great example because, you know, as a fellow manufacturing guy, you know, I spent 25 years doing it. The it's the inspection thing is it, I won't say always, cause I try not to speak in absolutes, but so often is step number one. Well, we'll just add inspection and that way we'll fix it. And, and I have a story I tell about, we added an inspector, our customer still got a uh, defective product. So then we added a second inspector, which is like, I look back at now that, at, you know, now and I cringe. Cause it's like, who thought that was going to be a good idea? Um, and actually it was, it's kind of funny now, but it wasn't then our quality went down when we added the mm-hmm. second inspector, because again, mm-hmm. if it's you and me, I think you're going to catch my mistakes. You think I'm going to catch yours and we both look less, right? Exactly. Yeah. You don't have that ownership in the job that you're doing because there's that safety net, um, that you think will catch any error that you might make. Yeah. I think Dimming actually talks about that somewhat, you know, when, when we add inspectors, we're actually being disrespectful in some way because we're taking that opportunity for the individual to own what they're, what they're doing and take pride in it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you're right. Cause there is that deferment almost, um, over here in Boston years ago, they had, a what they called the big dig, which was this, it was a giant, enormous civil engineering project, but the, um, one of the things, uh, a ceiling tile fell 
and actually crushed a car and killed somebody. And when I say tile, this thing was giant concrete. I forget the dimensions, but it was something like eight foot by four foot. It was huge. Uh, so enough to crush a car. And, you know, so they do the investigation, they figure out, you know, who the contractor was and all this stuff. Um, and one of the comments that that person made, which it, it was awful, but he's like, well, it's our job to do, you know, try to get away with stuff. It's the inspector's job to catch us. And I'm like, you know what? That is so wrong. I mean, that's an extreme example, but it's to your point of, yeah, well, if there's an inspector, I'm like, well, I'm just going to do whatever. And it's their job to check me. And it, that it, it kind of goes against the whole respect for people principle kind of in a way. Right. Mm -hmm. So well, absolutely. that. Sorry, go ahead. I was like, absolutely. That, that reminds me of a, another story that a friend of mine um, who lives a couple of hours away, he had a son. Um, they told me a story about where he was working in some construction job um, and there was some kind of large metal piping that they were rolling together to install um, somewhere. I'm not sure the details, but he goes, I always taught my son this acronym, PQPC. It's people, quality, productivity, cost. And that's the order in which you make decisions. And he said his son was on site and he was doing his welding. And there's a certain way he's supposed to do this weld. And the supervisor was like, you know what? We're running behind. Let's get this done quickly. You can just do some quick spot welds on this thing. The inspector is probably not going to come through even check this, so it won't even really matter. And his, my friend's son just wouldn't wouldn't do it. And um, so he actually said he, he went over on the wall, the interior wall of this pipe, and wrote PQPC on it, and then did the weld the way you should. And thank God he did, because the inspector actually came through and checked that particular pipe that day. Um, so had he cut the corners, that would have opened up a whole nother can of worms and rework and paperwork that would have been necessary. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's critical. Yeah, it certainly can be. I mean, it was an awful, awful, I mean, the whole situation that I brought up was awful, but mm -hmm. on a lesser degree, you know, sometimes we do think, well, ah, eh, you know, I'll cut a little bit of corner. I actually just got done teaching some green belt stuff yesterday. We talk about five uh, S and well, six S cause I had safety, you know, and I talk about just that where it's, you know, we're all under this constant pressure to produce the product or the service or whatever it is we do all day. Right. That's our main job. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes we, right. We take some liberties, we cut corners because standard work isn't correct or whatever, you know, I know better or whatever happens, happens. And then, you know, we assume some of that risk and I'm not, I always struggle because I don't understand why. Well, I guess I shouldn't say I don't understand why I do understand. Cause again, it's that pressure of just like the supervisor in your story, right? Well, we're running behind. We can make up some time. Yeah. But if you don't do it right, you know, what, you know, bad things can happen exactly. up into include, right. Hurting people, which is unacceptable. So I don't know anybody that, right. Would, would sign up to say, let's take that risk. You know, if it was a public thing, if right. Versus mm -hmm. if it's, ah, we'll just, we'll bury it. The inspector won't catch it. We can air quotes, get away with it. Yeah. Until the pipe caves in and or leaks and then cause other problems that for their heads. And then you have a task force are launched to figure out, well, why did this happen? <laughs> right. It costs so much less to do it right up front. I think what happens mm -hmm. sometimes is people do the math in their head and they, they determine, well, it's not going to be me that pays for it later. Right. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, I've done a lot of work around our house and one of our door exterior doors was held in by the exterior trim, which is wrong for the non construction <laughs> folks listening. Yes. Right. You're supposed to, it's supposed to be screwed into the house. So I took the trim off and now the whole door is falling at me. And the whole thing was rotted and I had, right. Because again, the builder cut corners, you know, 40 years ago when the house was built and here I am, I'm the, you know, guy holding the bag and now I got to fix it. But the person who built it and, and made the mistake is long gone. Right. So now I got to pay so much more, whereas they could have just taken five or 10 minutes, done it right. And it would have been okay. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. nonetheless. Yeah. So I want to go back to Kyle a little bit. Uh, Cause I really, I, I, I really am impressed with your uh, 14 Deming Point series. Can you talk, how did you come up with that idea? <clears throat> it it kind of came to me. Um, it's probably been over the past, I would say, year where I really started to dig more into Deming and who he was. Um, there's some other people I follow on 
on LinkedIn that are, um, I would say, dimming students. Um, Steve Feltovich, I think of his name, is one that um, talks a lot about him. And so I'd read his posts and then follow his links that he posted. And um, I'd, I'd go into like the dimming.org and read little articles on there. And then uh, over the last few months, I actually got a couple books and read, you know, I read uh, The New Economics and I'm mm-hmm. going to start reading Out of the Crisis um, to really get into Demi because when I was introduced to him early on in my life or my career, he was mentioned more just as a reference um, and lean and, th- and uh, even in my Six Sigma classes that I took, um, he was is mentioned as a reference, um, but I never really got any more detail than that. So I wanted to kind of get into, well, who is this guy and what do you really stand for and, and advocate for? Um, and so I came across his 14 points and I would make reference to him at work periodically and saying, hey, there's these 14 points and I kind of think we might be violating these two by doing this. And um, sometimes I would get a, oh, hey, that's an interesting thought or other times I get a, oh, that's nice. Go, mm-hmm. go away yeah. and do, do it, do as you're told. Um, <clears throat> but I don't, I, I didn't find out about those 14 points until I was probably in the workforce. I've only been in 11 years. So not that long. Um, maybe five years in. Um, and I just got to think, you know, I don't think these are talked about enough. Um, other people do talk about them in a way, um, you know, some of the stuff that Simon Sinek writes about ties into a lot of, uh, there's some, there's some crossover there with what Deming advocates for. And, you know, Richard Sheraton with Joy uh, Inc. Mm-hmm. Minimal, minimal Innovations and, you know, putting Joy back in work. Um, but I wanted to, you know, go, go to the source, read the source. What, what's Deming saying here? Um, and so then I, that's why I got the idea that I'll do my part to spread the word about him through just doing a weekly post about one of his points, putting my opinion out there about it. Here's what I interpret this to mean. And then I invite others to join into the conversation. And I think it was either last week. So the week before, so point six or seven, that post got a lot of traction. There's all kinds of comments and, and messages that came out of that one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's honestly the good part of social media is stuff like that, where, you know, somebody like you can, can say, Hey, here's what I think it means, right? Here's how I interpret it. And there's a lot of good stuff. And I a hundred percent agree with you. We don't talk about him enough. And, and there's a whole slew of lean background and knowledge, you know, and, and I'm one of the things I like to point to is, and, and this is, I won't say it's controversial, but maybe in our little lean circle, I say TPS wasn't invented. It was assembled right? Because they freely admit, oh no, Shingo. They say, well, we looked at Henry Ford and we listened to Deming and Duran and all this kind of stuff. And if you look back in our industrial revolution, right, you can draw back to Eli Whitney and Frank Gilbreth and obviously Taylor and Henry Ford, the whole deal, right? So I think sometimes maybe all that gets lost because we think about, and I'm not knocking them. I've met Jim Womack. He's a cool dude, right? But we think Womack, Jones, you know, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, like LEI, you know, because yeah. they wrote lean thinking machine that changed the world. Right. And that's what, you know, launched a thousand ships they, or a they, thousand they consultancies. Of, they, they, they took it mainstream. You're right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's so much more in the background. So I really appreciate the fact that you do that. So I'm anxious to see, yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot. So I hope maybe you can do another one like with somebody else after the 14 points are done. Yeah, I'll think something else to put up there. But you know, I've, I've done. A lot. I, I'm an avid reader, and I, I would agree with TPS being assembled. It, it wasn't like Toyota started whatever it was over 75 years ago and just said, "Here's what it's going to be." They they followed what Deming said and took the scientific approach, the PDCA approach, and just tested. Well, where do we have gaps? How can we close those? And this iterated from there. And over the course of time, TPS came about. Um, but they, you know, Ono didn't have that in his mind at the beginning that here's everything we're going to do so that in 10 years we're here and 20 years we're here. It just, it happened iteratively over time. And I think that's, I, that's, uh, it's harder over here for, I think, American companies to grasp that, um, that, you know, when they take long-term thinking, they're probably thinking three to five years. That's not a lot of time. You got to be thinking, is this company going to be here in 50 years? Because mm-hmm. that's going to drive a whole another level of thinking about how you what you do today, versus if you're only planning for it out to, out to five years. Right, right. And, and Toyota, Toyota was great at that. And that I think see, to me, and again, I'll I'll sprinkle my opinion in here. But to me, that's the magic of it is they knew they didn't know everything. So what they got really good at was 
PDCA and let's just try it and see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, we're not going to do it anymore. Right. And they just got really good at accepting that a lot of it's probably not going to work, but at least they tried and they got through it that much faster versus sometimes like what I've seen in my work history is we'll have some problem. And right. The, the, some manager assembles the team in a conference room and they start writing stuff up on the whiteboard. What do you think it could be? What do you, you know, well, I, this one time in 1992, right. I saw that. Oh, well, let's write that up there. And then, right. We divide into teams and we go, we go look for root cause. And it just, it's like, I don't know that. I mean, yeah. And sometimes, right. A blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. So yeah, sometimes we'd stub our toe and find what root cause was, but it wasn't a great way to problem solve. So to me, that's why I love, you know, and when I teach this stuff, that's what I say is you got to build the culture that supports trying things out and making, making it okay. If it doesn't work Mm -hmm. versus, you know, the using the F word failure, which I hate. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually another word that I think I've heard someone else say that, that they like to use instead of failure. And I forget what it is. Um, but no, it's just to, to tack on or add on to what you just said. Uh, it's not only learning what doesn't work, but even because something does work, doesn't mean you're always going to use it. Um, and then another story I remember reading about, it was a Toyota one where um, some of the manufacturers were again going in touring, kind of seeing what Toyota was doing in one of the, in their factories. And I believe at that point, that particular Toyota plant I uh, was using, and I might mis- mispronounce this word, a uh, Kamishi Bay board, or uh, Kamishi Bay. I, I don't know the pronoun- correct pronunciation. <clears throat> and so then the, the visitors, like, oh, yeah, that's how you know, they're using it. And like, oh, that looks like it'll work where, where we are. And so they take that back and they start trying to just use that, that one little tool without really knowing the context around why, why are they using it here in this plant? Well, then they go back, the American company goes back and visits later and notice and, you know, the, the same operators there, um, but they don't use those boards anymore. And that they would ask, well, why aren't you using this more? And they well, it, it served its purpose. It, it solved the problem we had at that point, but then we learned something better and we don't no longer need to use that tool. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we often get caught up in that, that cycle of, well, this has always worked um, and it might work, but it doesn't mean you can't find a better way of solving that problem later on. Um, and it's okay to throw away the whatever tool you were using and moving on to a better one. Agreed. And that's honestly, I think one of the things that I see quite a bit is, uh, and it does not, not even just with lean, but just, you know, operations processes in and of themselves. We have this, I don't know if it's a culture thing here in the West or what, but it's this, okay, you know, this mentality of, right, check, I'm done with that. And now I put it off out of my head and I'm on to something else because we help clients a lot of times with stuff like that. And I'll have conversations with, you know, I'll make it up engineering managers, quality managers, which will say, no, 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 you don't have to worry about that. We already did that. I'll be like, yeah, but when? Oh, like 10 years ago, you know, and it doesn't have to be a lean thing. And it's like, well, this always worked. So I don't understand why it doesn't work today. And that's where, again, I have the same conversation that to your point, it did work 10 years ago. Your business was less than half the size it is today, right? So the analogy I use is shoveling dirt. If I've got two shovelfuls of dirt, I'm going to go grab my shovel and move the dirt. However far apart I got to go. If I have a hundred I'm going to take some extra time to get the wheelbarrow out and then maybe use that. But if, right, you got to kind of gauge it based on that. And again, that's where Mm -hmm. I think the genius of TPS is, is they're not beholden to any one thing. And that's why it gets my knickers in a twist. When I see online that people are like, well, you're not doing it right. You know, fake lean and this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, hang on a second. Like, I don't think there is one right way to do all this stuff. Right. I don't know. Do you agree? uh, I, I would agree. It's, you know, I, I was taught traditionally, like most people have been taught tools first, and then here's kind of where you use the tools. And what I've come to realize now is that lean's more about thinking. How do you think? How do you view your, your business context that you're in? <clears throat> and then, and then from that, that understanding, then apply a tool, whether that's something Toyota has used or something brand new, you think up on your own. Again, it's, it's, it's the beauty of it. You, you know, go to the Gimba, see what's going on and then develop countermeasures. 
and test them out. And that's, that's yeah, that's, that's it. It's as easy as that. It's as hard as that. <laughs> yeah, right. And we say it out loud and it's like, duh. Right. Of course that's the way, but like I said, I, there's a story I tell in training, um, that we had a problem at this one plant that I was working at and say, we did the exact wrong thing. We get the, you know, the whole meeting of the minds together and we have these conference calls and this is way before zoom. So it was all on speakerphone and the, you know, the little triangular uh-huh. star Trek looking one right in the middle of the conference room table. And we've got people yep. in South Carolina and people up here in Connecticut and right. The whole thing. And we're trying to figure out what the heck's going on and, and call after call and all this other rigmarole literally a few weeks go by and we're banging our heads against the wall. Can't figure it out. And I happened to be out on the floor and I, I will admit, I didn't plan it this way, but it was a learning, you know, I, an aha moment for me, the guy that set this, the machine up, his name was Steve. And that's what we called them were setters. So we would have people that would set it up and then other people that would run it. So I'm out there and I'm staring at this machine and Steve comes over. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to figure this thing out and here, bump up, you know, I just kind of unload on him, you know? And he's an older Southern gentleman. He's just kind of, you know, he's kind of looking at me, watching me go. And he goes, you got one on you? Show me what you're talking about. So I had one and I showed him. It was a crack in a bearing race. And he looks at it and immediately, now, mind you, we have thousands of part numbers. He knows what it is right away. And he, he literally, three seconds, Kyle, he looks me in the eye and goes, I know what's doing this. And he was, he was right. He took me over to the tooling and he showed me in our, basically uh, it's going to be hard to envision, but picture like a, a ring, a metal ring. And instead of having two cutouts in the middle, it had four. So it almost looked like a four leaf clover. And the reason we did that was so we didn't have to necessarily put it into the machine one way. We could do it two different ways, either North, South or East, West. Well, it just so happened that that when we snapped this whole thing together, the pusher that snapped it together was right over those extra voids that we put. So it was just barely enough. And a hardened bearing race, when it's only 20, 30,000 thick, doesn't take a lot of deflection to crack. It's a lot like ceramic tile. And wouldn't you know, it was barely enough. It would be a hairline crack. You, and when it was put back together, you couldn't even see it with the naked eye but it would get put into an automatic transmission and then bad things happen. And had we just gone to Gemba and asked the question from the people that do the work, right. Who know best, we probably, we could have had this whole thing done with. So that was, I go back and that was raw man pushing 27 years ago now. And I can still remember that when he looked at me, that look on his face, he's like, I know what this is. And I'm thinking, mm-hmm. how could you possibly, you know, we've all these smart people, but he knew it. Yeah, no, that, that's a great example. Um, there's another one. I, I was part of a, a warehouse management system project to, repl- to replace the warehouse management system. And this new one that we were looking at that we were in, in the process of implementing, uh, we were going through and, and getting down to the details. And, and one of the, the ideas that came up is, uh, you know, for some of these products, you essentially drive around in a fork truck, you have a scan, an RF scanner, you have scan barcodes, and that, and then that tells you, yep, this is the right product. You have to scan the shipping label, stick it on, throw it on your pallet, and, and pick your list. Well, they were proposing in order to do it the way we were, um, and get to work right in their system, they're going to add one extra scan, um, which you know it takes literally a second. And so that's what they said, and that's like, oh, okay, one second. That's not that big of a deal. And I, then I thought and raised my hand, like, hold on a second. You know, today, that's, you know, we're, we're doing this millions of times over the year. And it's only going to get more and more as the company grows, as time goes on. So here's what millions of seconds <laughs> turns out to be in a, day, in a time where we're already trying to take time out of the process. So just one extra second for each person, each each scan, it's, it's going to add up. Um, so we've, we've got to... Um, think about this differently. And the, but the only reason I even thought about that is because I had been a picker before. So I knew that job. I knew what the impact that, that this change would have. Um, everyone else in the room, they didn't have that context. Yep. And that's the empathy. Uh, I guess I'll call it empathy, right? Where it's that mm-hmm. understanding of, uh, you know, what are we putting our people through? There's that, mm-hmm. I think it's a Deming quote, right? A bad process will beat a good person every time. 
it's one yeah. of those things yeah. where, and I've seen it over and over. And I think about that quote and it's like, yeah, you know, what processes do we, you know, we're putting people in positions that have to, you know, and we're giving them metrics. So, you know, and, and whether you use a meatball chart, when I see meatball chart, I mean like red, yellow, green, right. Um, and if it's all green, the general consensus belief is that everything's fine. And I always challenge that. And I say, well, what does it take to make it so it is green? Are the, are you people killing themselves? Are they lying to you? Because yeah. they know if it's yellow or red, they're going to get, you know, we're here for management and we're here to help. Right. So are they scooting stuff over to the side and not right. reporting, you know, not. And again, I don't blame them for that because that's the culture. That's the process that they were given. And then, oh, by the way, go as fast as you can, because we got to make shipments this week, month, quarter or whatever. Mm -hmm. right yeah exactly yeah it's uh when i got this comment on someone's post the other day it's you know teams say yes we, we achieved our target and then you know a good leader would ask well how did you achieve it so even if yeah it is green how did, what was the process you used to achieve it mm -hmm. um, and if it's taking long nights and 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 uh, missed sporting events and and anniversaries and dinners well that's a problem we, we need to think about how we're you know, we need to think about how our people are spending their time at work because, um, you know, it directly affects the quality of their time outside of work. Absolutely. And that's a big thing. I mean, I always, a lot of times I'll start our workshops off with understanding what is work. I call it, what is work? And I lay it out and I use the numbers. And at the end, I basically prove to them that they spend so little time at home Monday through Friday and so much time at work away, you know, if you take out sleeping, it is a little depressing, but, I, and I even I set it up that way, but it's all the more important, right. To explain that. So people understand it. So then they can be like, oh, okay. Now I understand why it's so important that we, we present our processes and, and have people, right. Put them in positions where they can be successful as well as maybe, I don't know, have some fun at work. Like, why is that so bad? Yeah. Right. Right. So what are you up to now? Yeah, I know we, I kind of jumped right in on you, but what are you up to now? Like, what are you into? Uh, a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my, my, my world now I'm, I'm in financial services and I work in a product management office and I, but I, my, my re responsibility isn't around managing projects so much. It's around um, teaching others the process of managing a project. And, and how to manage a project and then de defining what it is that our process for uh, from start to finish of a project, not even from just launching it, but, you know, ideation, how do we even go through and, form and formulate an idea to do something? Um, so that's, um, that's why you, you'll read my, my LinkedIn tagline is ending human suffering as it relates to process and financial services. Um, I've had people message me about that and laugh and like that just, that's funny mm -hmm. because you know, all of us have a relationship with a bank. We, you know, whether it's just the basic checking account all the way up through, you know, mortgages, car loans, whatever. Um, if you're a business owner, then there's all, a whole other slew of products that you can use. But uh, I've been part of many banks as, as a customer, and it's not always easy to be be their customer. You know, opening a checking account nowadays is a lot easier than it used to be. Um, so now as we're, we're launching these projects and these big initiatives to enhance and change our customer experience, um, you know, it takes more than signing a contract and paying a vendor money for their, their, their technology. We need to understand what is our process that we use to serve our customer and deliver our products and services. And then what technology can we go buy to help better enable us to do that? Because uh, if we don't understand what we want to do and how we want to serve our customers, if we go buy that technology, then we're going to be forced into how they think we should do it. And that's not aligned with what our customers expect. And it's just kind of, it's kind of like cutting corners. You're going to um, have a lot more rework, a lot more total costs down the line now with unhappy customers. Mm. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I'm into um, working on right now in the financial team and with the organization and helping to advocate for things like that. Nice. Nice. So can you hum a few bars? And again, I know you can't right, reveal everything because you're currently doing it, but can you talk a little bit about how do you, how do you get that information from customers? You know, is it customer feedback, uh, MFA, like what is it? And then how do you, 
um, set up those projects internally to make sure that people just aren't going and saying, oh yeah, if we get this new whiz bang software, everything will be better. How do you, how do you do that part? Yeah. So I think it's pretty common. Most companies will do customer surveys, um, in various ways to get, there's various ways to get customer feedback. Um, I, I, I find surveys to be moody, but they're kind of the best thing we have most often to try and get something. Um, you know, if you catch someone on, if you catch me on a bad day, I'm going to give you a, a different rating than what I would if I was, mm-hmm. you know, happy. Um, um, even if I, I was unhappy, it had to do with, with you or your service. Right. Um, but we, we, we do collect surveys like, like that way. Um, and then we've got various members of leadership who know, okay, here's our strategy. Here's what we're hearing from our customers. Um, cause I do know our leadership team will actually go out and visit customers. They don't, they don't all just sit behind their desk, um, you know, at home now they'll, they'll talk to customers. So they, they're, they're getting that feedback sometimes firsthand and not only one customer, but they can intuitively know that they're probably not the only one thinking this. And then they can go ask questions to other customers and start to see trends. And yeah, we, this is a theme. Um, so then that comes back in. And so one of the things that we do through the, the PMO is help make sure that any new idea for a project that comes through we can directly tie it to a strategy and say, how does, how does this fit? And is this truly taking a chunk of this strategy and then moving the ball forward? Or is this just more like a, a shiny object that just because the competitor on the street is doing it, we think we should do it. I um, mean, you know, that, that's not a good reason to, to launch a, a project, especially mm-hmm. one that's going to take several months, you know, have two commas in the price tag and, right. <laughs> and all that. Um, and just take all that time to deliver something that really isn't, doesn't align with what, what we want to do. Um, so that's kind of a, a general example of one of the things that the PMO tries to help the organization do. Um, it's harder than it sounds because obviously people are used to working in different ways and just kind of, kind of getting what they want. Um, you know, uh, it, it, like I said before, it takes more than just signing a contract and paying a vendor money. Um, there's, there's a lot more to actually deploy a solution. So then that's the easy part. The hard part after that is the adoption. Okay, we have a new product or we have a new way of delivering a product. Um, now our internal, uh, customers, our employees need to know how to operate that new process. I mean, our sales team need to know how to help their customers through this new application to, to submit a loan request, for example. Um, and that's even a bigger mountain to climb and to get enough customers on board with that new way of, of interacting with us and getting our products and services. Gotcha. Can you, so, is ne- never a dull moment. Yeah, I was going to say, right, it, it sounds easy when you put it that way, but I'm sure mm-hmm. the inner workings nuts and bolts part is less than that, mm-hmm. less than easy. Right. Um, how many, like, for instance, how do you, so is that basically how you manage for each project is you kind of get that, you know, and I'm, I'm, it's encouraging to hear that the leadership actually gets up and goes out and right, and that's obviously important per our conversation we had five minutes ago. Versus just sending out surveys and you get the feedback mm-hmm. and you put po- like, I've worked for those companies that will do that. And then they'll post the results and they're like, oh, we got a four and a half on this. So I guess we're doing okay. Right. Whereas, you know, maybe if we had this conversation, you know, face to face or face to group or something, you could feel that, you know, you could mm-hmm. feel something a little more tangible versus just reading data off a computer screen. So is that how you mostly manage it? Is that what you try to teach people is important? That's important. That's just, that's just one piece of it. You know, going back to earlier about cutting corners, um, especially when you're dealing with technology projects, that's, you know, high level designs, like how would this even work? We don't need the, the blueprint. How do we code everything? But if we're going to use some new technology, like just conceptually, what are some basic high level requirements that, that would make this work? For example, if it was going to be something around uh, some kind of new online account opening software, which is very common now. Mm. But one of the requirements is that we, you know, customers need to be able to open an account in 10 clicks or less. Like that's a requirement. Okay. If we know that up front, how do we build something like that? Can we build something like that? Uh, is, it, is it worth it to build something like that? Um, so that's why having it, it's more than just, oh, yes, our customers say they want to open accounts online. Let's, let's buy an online account opening software and deploy it. it how is that going to work in our, our context with our customers? Mm. And can we, can we do that? Um, so there's a lot of upfront, I would say, planning um, that somewhat 
you know, it, it might seem like it slows down a decision on whether or not we should do something or get funding for it. Um, but like we've also just mentioned earlier in our conversation, it, if you do that right up front, um, the actual project goes much smoother itself and you actually know that what you're building is what your customers need, what your employees need, and it, it fits within your, your business context. And then you're not going back chasing your tail and fighting fires after the fact. Right. Um, so you're almost three peeing your way through it up front, even though it's not, a, you know, you're not making a widget. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What a concept mm-hmm. though, huh? You think about it up front yeah. and plan it out. I mean, we got to yeah. write that down. Yeah, log- lo- yeah. You know, logically walk through. Okay. If I were a customer and I were doing this, you know, there's ways you can mock it up um, even digitally and virtually with yeah. all the new technologies we have out there. Um, and just do a dummy test of it. And yeah, you know what? That would probably work. And you know what? That, that would not work at all. Why are we even thinking about trying to do this? Right. Um, so, so yeah, yeah you can apply applies. the, yeah, apply the PDCA model. Right. And just, mm-hmm. right. Try it out. Cool. Yeah. All right, Kyle. So I always like to take a little bit of a break in the air quotes, formal portion of the podcast and play a game I call the wicked fun part. You up for this? Let's go for it. All right. Fire it up. What's your favorite song and why? Why? Ooh. Let's see. What song have I been listening to a lot? So I, <clears throat> I was actually asked this question last week on a presentation I gave um, oh. uh, for a conference. And so a song I've been listening to uh, a lot recently actually goes back to my high school years. It's an Eminem song. That's called Lose Yourself. Um, it's very popular when I was in high school, and I actually would listen to it before every golf match. It's kind of like a pump up, like getting a mental state type of song. Um, and I've been listening to it a lot recently when I've been in the car or even just sitting here at my desk. Um, but the reason why I like it so much, uh, you know, for me, it's about, I think one of the lines of the song is about lose yourself in the moment. So it's, you know, focus. What, what's important right now? so you can accomplish whatever next uh, obstacles in your path or whatever kind of goal you're, you're trying to achieve. Um, and so that, that's why I like that song. That's why I've always enjoyed it. And I've, I've always kind of gone through stages um, since high school where I'll go through spurts of turn that song on a lot. And uh, you know, it, it shows up there quite a bit on my, my iTunes playlist. There you go. Well, they always say, right. The, the songs we listen to in high school are like the, the ones that kind of stick with us. They, they are. You know, my, my dad always talked about the stuff he used to in high school. And I'm like, who? What are you, yeah, <laughs> what are you, I know. Talking about? <laughs> right. I mean, I could whip out. I would. I'm, I'm an '80s hair band guy, so I'm, mm-hmm. I predate you by a couple of decades. <laughs> Speaking of, what were you like in high school? I was actually pretty quiet and shy, unless I was with my my close group of friends. Um, you know, I, I remember my first day of high school. Uh, even though I rode the bus in with my neighborhood neighborhood friends all went in, um, you know, we we're all, all going to have different classes, uh, bigger classes. People I didn't know, like I, I was a nervous wreck that first day walking into a big, a big high school. And my high school wasn't even that big. It was, you know, relative to others in the area, we were 1200 students and not, not huge. Um, yeah, it wasn't really until later on in high school, uh, once I got more involved in, in sports, uh, and, and some activities that I kind of came in my shell a little bit. Um, you know, I, I did some, uh, we had a, a lip sync competition. Every year of the classes would battle each other in the lip sync competition um, during homecoming. And I got involved in a couple of those later on in my career, but early on, I'm like, nope, I'm never, I'm not getting it from anybody. You know, I, I'd freaked out to give a, a, a speech and communications class. Mm. So I was, I was a pretty quiet and reserved kid in high school for the most part, unless I was with my close group of friends and I'd be a little more uh, outgoing and, um, you know, maybe, maybe do some things that are not so introverted in nature. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. All on the same theme. What'd you want to be when you were little, little kid? So when I was little, um, so I grew up with a, in Indiana. So the Hoosier state basketball was huge in Indiana until Peyton Manning came along and turned it into a football state. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, but I was a big Michael Jordan fan and I played basketball from the time I was four on. Uh, and so I always wanted to be a professional basketball player. Um, that's always what I thought I was going to be when I was little. Hmm. And then, then I got a little older into middle school and realized not very many people make it to professional basketball. Yeah. <laughs> so um, then I picked up golf. Hey, there you go. What position did you play in basketball? Just out of curiosity. 
Um, depending on the team we're playing, I played as either a small forward or a power forward. Oh, wow. I was a shooting yeah. guard. Shooting guard, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could score, but I was actually I was a better defensive player. I, I had, I've had more game-winning steals than game-winning shots. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a nice statistic. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, now I just do men's league and it's, yeah, it is what it is. Now it's like, we're just, you know, <laughs> five minutes in half the guys aren't even running up and down the floor anymore. So <laughs> I, what are you going to do? Yeah, that's why right. I like golf. You can play it until you're play it till you die. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, speaking of golf, I can see behind you, you've got some, uh, it looks like a plaque of golf balls. And if my, mm-hmm. I spy with my little eye, a couple of drama dolls back there are those from katie anderson yes they are those are from katie nice now the eyes yeah. filled in or half or what's the deal one is the the red one has an eye filled in um so that one i'm working on a goal there on that one that's been in progress now oh, several months it's actually kind of dwindling but I, I gotta pick that one back up but yes i i learned about Druma dolls from her and, and reading through her book and reached out to her and said hey mind sending me a few and she obliged. So I, I have uh, connected with Katie a few times and uh, enjoy following her stuff. Yeah. She's wicked cool. I've met her. She's been on the show twice now. I, you can't see it it's directly yeah. behind me, but I have a red one with one eye in it too. It's actually uh, been filled in a little longer than yours. And I get it same. I got to get back on the horse and, uh, and get going with it. Yeah. Uh, last one. What superpower do you wish you had? Superpower. <clears throat> well, my favorite superhero is Batman. He's only superpowers. He's just a human being. But uh, I would say if I had any superpower, it would probably be the ability to time travel. Yeah, I think I'm right there. It's either that one or invisibility. I, you know, well, yeah. I mean, being 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 an introvert, invisibility would be awesome. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, the ability to you know, I've watched several shows about time travel just you know fictional stories um just the ability to kind of go back and experience some moments in history would be be amazing it would be pretty cool right and you play stock market there you go (laughs) right plan ahead there you go all right kyle so we have a few minutes left i always like to just kind of throw it over to the guest um any words of wisdom uh, anything you'd like to share that you're passionate about that you think the listeners could get something out of? Yeah, I think I, I touched on it earlier, something about, um, you know, the, the t- we need to be uh, intentional about the way our people spend their time at work because it directly in fact impacts the quality of their time outside of work. Um, you know, I, I've come to learn in my short career that work isn't everything, um, but that you know, it should be fun. Should there should be joy involved? It should make us better people, so that we can go home and be better, better spouses and parents and members of society. Um, and so, anything that we can do to to make our people better versions of themselves is is a win. And I think lean continuous improvement they they play right into that. One hundred percent agree. And then you know maybe we can hook up again and maybe we'll write a book or do a podcast series or something. I don't know, but. I, I think that's a valid point. And I, and I know we talk about it a lot in our social circles, but I don't know if we talk about it enough is that interaction between what happens at work, you know, cause there's that old adage, you know, whatever happens at work or home, leave it at the door or whatever. We, I, you can't, you, sometimes we can. Mm-hmm. Right. And I know a lot of us try, but there are some days and I'm guilty of this. Like I had, you know, I've had jobs where I'd walk in the door and the first thing is my wife and my daughters will look at me and get a bead on what kind of day I had. And if it's plain and, and right, that I didn't have a good day, right. It's just not good at home. You know, not that I'm yelling and throwing things. That's not me, but they're nervous. Right. And then it's like, this isn't good. And actually, to be honest with you, that's why I quit. And that's why I went out on my own or one of the reasons mm-hmm. because I couldn't, manage that and you know maybe it's a little bit on me too but you know to your point the company i worked for while a lot of good things there was a lot of bad stuff too and that was all stuff that i couldn't control but it affected me and Mm -hmm. i'm not a person that i can just 
you know, put it in a different bucket in my head and that's work. And I got to check yeah. it. You know, I know people like, I have a lot of friends who are policemen, mm -hmm. right. And they have to be able to do that stuff because they deal with some awful, awful things. Yes. Right. So they can do that. I'm not one of those people. So to your point, I think we owe it to our folks, right? As a job that earns money, that pays for our all the other stuff we have in life. I think part of our jobs is to do that, is to make our jobs, everybody's job, more enjoyable so we can all be better people throughout the whole rest of our lives. I mean, think yeah. about how nice life would be if that were the case. Yeah. And it's, I think it's even more important now, now that we've learned that people can work virtually, remotely. So now my home office, is, it's, it's a home. My, I work at a home. So I don't have a separate office to go to and, and to, to come home from. So now it's how do I make sure when I leave this desk at the end of the day that I go back upstairs and I'm, you know, some days you have bad days. It, it's going to happen. Um, but it shouldn't be that way all the time consistently. Right. Right. That's a flag, right? That says something's mm -hmm. wrong. Yeah. Right. Nice. All right, Kyle. Well, dude, I can't say thank you enough. Thank you for coming on the show and sharing your stories. I, I know I get a lot out of it. I'm sure the listeners will as well. So thanks again. Well, great. And good luck tomorrow. I know I, you told me before we hopped thanks on. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And I know tomorrow um, you're going to go watch some golf. So have fun with that. Hopefully go watch some of the, you know, the best players in the world practice um, tomorrow and maybe walk away with some autographs. There you go. Get some tips. Get some tips. Yeah. I can get, get plenty of those. Yeah. <laughs> Write them down and send them to me because I need them too. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of amateur golfers that could use some help, but uh, no, great, great being on the show. Enjoyed our talk. Uh, you know, we'll be talking on LinkedIn thread and any the listeners want to get in touch, you know, LinkedIn's a great way to get in touch with me. And uh, I'm, I've started the hashtag. It's a uh, hashtag suffer less and prove more. All my posts have that in there. So if you follow the hashtag, you'll see, see all my posts. Great. Thank you. I was going to ask how folks can get in touch with you, but so yeah, and I'll link to your LinkedIn profile and everything. I'll include that hashtag in there. So people will make it easy. They can just click it. Awesome. Cool. All right, Kyle. Thanks again. Yep, thank you. All right. Take it easy. See ya.